The Equitable Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society, for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Serviceman's Fraud. The war is over and the fighting men are coming home. But for the FBI, the war, the fight against fascism is not over. In a sense, it still goes on. Because the fight against democracy still goes on. Not only overseas, but right here in this country. In a Midwestern state, for example, where a thin, white-haired man named Martin Bessemer was trying to form an organization called the United Brotherhood of America. Bessemer made his speeches in a large hall, and in his audiences were many veterans of our war against fascism. Directly behind this hall, he had his offices, a large outer reception room and a small inner office used only by Bessemer, by his red-haired secretary and by his business manager, a hard, quiet-faced man called Frank Kingston. Leila, hmm? you finished typing that letter? Right over there. Oh, okay. When's Bessemer going to sign it? As soon as he finishes rousing the rabble. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, you know, baby, a million copies of this ought to open a few thousand vets with plenty of separation pay. They could all hear him talk. You know something funny, Frank? Hmm? I listened to him the other day. And you almost believed him. Almost? If I'd had my purse, I would have handed over the membership fee and joined up. <laughs> well, the more suckers who feel that way, the more money in the bank for us. For us? Yeah. We're in it together, baby. Frank. Huh? When are you going to get him to sign that check? I told you when that when... When the he... time comes. Yeah. And I told you, I'm not going to sit around here waiting for dollar bills to start... Hello, Mr. Bessemer. Hello, Frank. Hello, Lila, my dear. Hello, Mr. Bessemer. Uh, I've been working hard today, haven't you? Pretty hard. Well, I'll take your dinner tonight and make sure you're getting enough to eat. Oh, uh, here's the letter we drew up, Mr. Bessemer. Ah, thank you. Uh, the United Brotherhood of America has a particular appeal for our veterans. I realize their plight and promise to give every honorably discharged man who joins the Brotherhood a battle bonus amounting to... I've never promised anything of the kind, Frank. Well, there are a couple of million vets waiting for somebody to lead them someplace, Mr. Besson. You know, vets with dough. <laughs> you want to get them to join, don't you? Well, naturally. Then sign here. Oh, now, look. Uh... You hired me to boost your membership. Sign here. Kingston, nobody tells me what to do. Nobody. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Besson. Or I didn't mean to sound as though I were giving orders. I... Just thinking that if we can pull in the vets, the organization ought to get big enough to swing your election at the state legislature. Or maybe even Congress. Hmm. Well, in that case, uh, let me have your pen, Frank. Okay. Here. Uh, thanks. Uh, there we are. I'll pick you up about six, uh, Lila. Okay. Goodbye, my dear. Bye. Goodbye, Frank. Uh, goodbye now. He'll pick me up at six. So what? So we'll have dinner and he'll slobber over me again. All right. All right, nothing. What kind of a guy are you to let someone else take your... You girl... won't be bothered much longer. No? No. Our friend just signed his last will and testament. This letter? Yeah. It's going to mean a killing for us and a finish for him. How? Well, it's going to hook a lot of poor fish, baby. But it's also going to make somebody start an investigation. For instance, I don't know. But when they come around, we're going to be gone. And Mr. Martin Bessemer's going to be left holding the bag. (laughs) 
it's easier to get a mailing list of veterans. And it's easy to stir up some of those veterans. The end of the war doesn't mean peace for the country. It means a period of transition, reconversion, change. Many fighting men who have come home want that period to be swift and sure and right. So when they read a letter like Martin Bessemer's, many vet- veterans get excited. Some want to join his organization. And some, some react the way a boy like Eddie Butler did. Eddie is calling on his girl. Sorry I kept you waiting, Eddie. Like my new dress? Huh? I asked you if you liked my new dress. Oh, yeah. Yeah, new, isn't it? Eddie, when we get married, my clothes That won't... bird ought to have his head handed to him. Hmm? What are you talking about? I'm sorry, honey. A letter came this afternoon. I didn't get a chance to read it. You read it now. Put it away. But look at it. I don't want to. From a gent named Martin Bessemer. He's the head of an outfit called... The United Brotherhood of American Wars. I know. How do you know? My brother Bobby got one this morning. What'd he say? Oh, I don't know. He said he wants to join... Join this? Yes. Well, he can read, can't he? Listen to this. The United Brotherhood is an organization restricted to members of the Caucasian race. That's a fancy way of saying Aryans. All right, Eddie. And this juicy little warning that we veterans have to rise up and throw the foreigners... All right, Eddie. But, Nora, don't you see... Give me that letter. Nora! I'm sorry. I don't get it, honey. I don't get you. Me? Eddie, sit down. No, here by me. Okay. Darling, I know it was pretty bad overseas, and you went through a lot. But you're home now, darling, and the war is over. The fighting's over, you mean. What? As long as there are weasels like this Martin Bessemer around, it's not over. Look, honey, I I get mad, but don't try to chalk it up to combat fatigue or anything like that. I get mad because I see that maybe there's a chance all that fighting was for nothing. Eddie, that's silly. Silly, yeah, and your kid brother joins a peachy little group restricted to members of the Caucasian race. He's a kid, and it's a small, unimportant organization. There are a couple of million kids and plenty of these small, unimportant organizations for them to join. Eddie. No, I am mad. I don't like it, Nora. I don't like that it's going on, and we let it go on. What can we do? I know what I'm going to do. What? I'm going to join Mr. Bessemer's little restricted bunch. What? He'll get me into one of his meetings so I can find out what he's up to. If he's up to what I think he is, Mr. Martin Bessemer better watch out. Martin Bessemer did not know that the FBI had been checking on his activities. But he'd been smart enough to stop just short of a violation for which he could be arrested. And now one of his letters come to the FBI's attention. Martin Bessemer. Yeah, According to the files, Dan, he's been spreading his poison since 1937. He was mixed up with a bun, but he went into hiding as soon as we invaded North Africa. Smart boy. Uh Uh-huh. But now he's out again. We've never been able to get anything on him. Even this new organization he's trying to get started has a bona fide setup legally. Well, maybe this letter is what we've been waiting for. I think it is. As a matter of fact, I think he's bitten off more than he can chew in this one sentence right here. Look. He promises to give every honorably discharged man a battle bonus. Yeah, probably sucked in a lot of members that way. But if he can't pay off, we can put him out of business. Right. Beats me how a rat like that can keep going anyway. It's a wonder that someone doesn't get so mad at him that... Well, let's get moving. We'd better take a good look at Mr. Martin Bessemer's books. about time you showed up. I've had my hands full, Lila. Who was she? Oh, stop being cute. I just had a big session with some vet named Eddie Butler. He's helped to knock Bessemer's block off. I know. He was here before. But we've got a bigger problem. What do you mean? I had a visitor. A gentleman named Sherman. Sherman? From the FBI. What do you want? To look at the books. You didn't let him? No. But he said he'd be back at three. Hmm. Almost that now. I know. What are we going to do, Frank? Oh, it's going to be all right, baby. It says here. I tell you, it's going to be all right. All this means is that we clear out a little ahead of schedule. Without the money? With the money. Well, he hasn't signed that check yet. Huh. You will. Hello, Lila, my dear. Oh, hello. Oh, Frank. 
Oh, I'm glad you're here, Mr. Bessemer. Uh, anything wrong? Well, yes, we've gotten some disturbing news. What? Well, the FBI was here to look at our books. The FBI? Why? Well, I guess it's because of that last letter you sent out. One where you promised the boys a battle bonus. You see, if they look at our books and find that you can't pay that bonus, they could send you up for fraud. Go on. Well, I've got a check here already for your signature, Mr. Bessemer. It's for the money in our account. Well, uh, what do you plan to do with it? We can take the money and run. Take it and run? Yeah. You cheap jinx! Don't be so easy with your hands, Mr. Bessemer. You've got everything ready, haven't you? You knew this was coming and you planned for it. So what? You cheap little racketeer. Easy, Bessemer. Uneducated scum that'll do anything for money. I warned you. You are scum. You're from the slums and your parents were... Now, maybe you'll keep your hands to yourself. He's dead, Frank. I don't care. What are you going to do? What are we going to do, you mean? What? We're in it together, baby. Remember? And we're good. Shh. What's the matter? Somebody's in the outer office. Huh? I heard him. We'll see who it is. Just open that door a crack. Oh, Frank. Go on. It's that boy. What boy? That veteran, Eddie Butler. The one who wanted to knock Bessemer's head. <laughs> We're both thinking the same thing, baby. Frank. It'll work. Come on. Help me lift Bessemer's body behind the desk. Oh. Why? You don't want the kid to see him when he walks in. No. <sighs> no. Where's that check? Here. What are you going to do? Get out the back door into the bank before it closes. Well, the check's not signed. Oh, that's okay. I know his signature. Frank. Stop worrying, baby. I'll get in touch with you and let you know where I am. You won't forget. We're in it together, aren't we? Yeah. We're in it together, all right. Okay. Here. What? Take my gun. You know what to do with it, don't you? Yeah. So long, baby. Mr. Butler? Yeah? Come in, won't you? Thanks. You're waiting to see Mr. Bessemer? Yeah, I saw him come in here and then... Say, did I hear a couple of shots? Shots? Why, no. Not from here. Oh, what you must have heard... Was... What's the matter? Look behind the desk. Huh? Holy... It's Bessemer. And isn't this yours? What? This gun. Here, take it. But... It's yours, isn't it? No. Oh, yes, it is. Come in. Oh, Mr. Sherman. I'm so glad you're here. This man just shot Mr. Bessemer. <laughs> We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation file on The Serviceman's Fraud. We will return to this case in just a moment. There's something about the name of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States that seems to arouse quite a lot of interest. Again and again, people say to us, by the way, why is the Equitable Society called a society? Well, that question is easily answered. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is called a society because it is a society in every sense of the word. It is an association of men and women who share the conviction that contentment and security depend on practicing the basic American virtues of thrift and self-reliance and cooperation. We who are members of the great Equitable Society family know that it isn't enough to work for ourselves alone. We know that we do better when we lend each other a helping hand. And that is why we have joined forces in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. 
We have combined our dollars into a common protective fund, which gives each of us far more security than he could attain by his own unaided efforts. The fact that three and a quarter million Americans think this way and have become Equitable Society members gives our organization tremendous stability and safety. At the same time, the fact that this is a society means that we individual members receive personal consideration and warm, friendly attention in all our dealings with the management. Finally, we have the satisfaction of knowing that our premium dollars are constantly invested in ways that benefit the entire nation. For, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on the serviceman's fraud. A murder is committed. A murder that's buried in the back pages because the victim is seemingly unimportant. The killer seems to be unimportant, too. Seems to be a boy named Eddie Butler. A boy with a motive with a gun marked with his fingerprint. A boy who is actually seen by an eyewitness. The case seems open and shut, seems to be as simple as ABC. Nevertheless, the FBI, working with local police, investigates, and investigates thoroughly. You say Butler was here earlier, miss? Oh, yes. He was raving about getting hold of Mr. Bessemer and knocking his head off. But you got rid of him. Oh, I thought I did. But then he came back about an hour ago. He just stormed in here and made a wild speech, and then he took out his gun and fired. That was a few minutes before three. Yeah. Well, I feel sorry for the kid, but that happened. What happened? Well, you know, those boys are trained to kill. They go overseas and do a lot of killing, and it just gets in their blood. They come home, see something they don't like, so they kill. Is that what Mr. Bessemer thought? Why? It sounds like something he might have said. I guess you liked Mr. Bessemer. No. But it was a job, Mr. Sherman. You didn't mind working for a man like that? Well, I... I'm sorry. It's really none of my business. If there's anything else we want, I'll let you know. A murder is committed. But it was a letter which brought the FBI to this case. A letter involving a plan to defraud veterans. And so the books of the organization called the United Brotherhood of America are turned over to a special agent, while the agent in charge aids the local police to follow up the murder. Follow it up by sending the gun in the case to the FBI laboratory in Washington. Follow it up by interviewing Eddie Butler in his cell. Doesn't make any sense, Mr. Sherman. The murder? None of it. You know, I I was thinking, suppose I really had shot Bessemer. He was a fascist. In the Army, they taught us what a fascist is, and overseas we saw him and killed some of them. Bessemer wasn't any different, Mr. Sherman, except maybe he was born here. Uh, Don't try to make any sense out of that, Eddie. It won't go out of your head. You think I'm going out of my head anyway. Mr. Sherman, I, I didn't kill Bessemer, but I'm glad he was killed. And even if it hangs me, I'll keep saying that. So maybe I am out of my head. Eddie, uh, you're sure there wasn't anybody else in that office when you walked in? Just a girl. What about earlier? I thought I saw that guy go in, but I don't know. What guy? Some gent who'd been trying to get rid of me. What was his name? I don't know. What did he look like? Oh, pretty solid. A little taller than me. Kind of a thin, hard face. Dark hair. That's all I remember. And you don't know who he was? Well, he said he was Bessemer's business manager. Business manager? Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks very much. What'd you get out of the books, Dan? Oh, pretty much what we figured. Bessemer couldn't have paid off that battle bonus if he stood on his head. Not that he had any intention to. Of course not. Matter of fact, all the money was drawn out of the bank. When? About one minute before three. The teller remembered because he was ready to close up. Bessemer was dead by then. Sure. But I don't know who the man was who cashed the check. Probably countersigned with a phony. That's what I figured. The check's on its way to the lab. Good. 
I got a description of him, though. Slightly over medium height, dark hair, thin face. Say, that sounds like the same man Butler described. Really? Yeah. This is beginning to make sense, Dan. There's somebody else in this. Somebody who was possibly double-crossing Bessemer. Somebody who possibly murdered Bessemer or helped the girl murder. <clears throat> Hello? Sherman speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Where? Thanks. What was that? A report just came in on the gun. Serial number was filed off, but the lab got it anyway. Could they trace it? Well, the last place they traced it to was a pawn shop over on the south side. Now, look, we don't want to arrest you for selling the gun. We just want to know who you sold it to. I told you. I don't know his name. What did he look like? He was, oh, a little shorter than you. Dark. Kind of a... Wait. What? I just remembered. His name was Frank. That's what she called him. Frank. That's what who called him? The girl who was with him. A very pretty girl with red hair. Here's a report on the check, Dan. Was it a forgery? Sure. Same guy who countersigned it forged it. What's his name? Kingston. Frank Kingston. We have a lead on where he's hiding. Williams traced a call the girl made him last night. Well, let's get him then. Yeah, there's a catch. What? We can probably hold him on fraud, forgery, larceny, but... but how do we get him on murder? Yeah. As long as that girl sticks to her story, we're... You know, like... if there were only some way of getting one of them to double-cross the other... Say, I have an idea. What's that? The old bellboy trick. It might work. They've never seen you. So if we can get that girl over to Frank Kingston's apartment tonight... <laughs> Anybody to run this elevator? Hey! Hey, isn't there anybody... Take it easy, lady. Who are you? Bellboy, clerk, elevator boy, what do you have? Now, since this is an elevator, what did you think? Uh, sorry you had to wait. We had a lot of checkouts today. Dump like this, I'm not surprised. What floor? Five. Five? Yeah, do you mind? No, I don't mind. Only I don't think there's anybody up there. What? Well, there was only two people. 503, she checked out this morning. And 514, he checked out a few minutes ago. 514 couldn't have. I just spoke to him on the phone. Yeah, I know. How do you know? Also worked the switchboard. Lady calls, and two minutes later, 514 calls to say he's checking out. I don't believe you. Well, see for yourself. It's right over here. But he checked out. Oh, it's open. Frank. Frank. See? What did I tell you? So he's gone. Sure. Oh, that's great. That's just dandy. Little Frank, he's gone for a walk with his pocket stuffed with money. That's beautiful. Something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Where's your phone? What are you going to do? Call the police. That man who checked out murdered Martin Bessemer. I saw him do it. I don't think you'll get very far, miss. To Sherman. He's still downstairs waiting for you. Downstairs? Sure. This is 614, Lila. Six? But but this elevator, boy... Also House Detective and FBI. So that's the way it is. Yeah. What do you think Frank is going to say when he hears the news? I think I know. He'll say we're in it together, baby. <laughs> Frank Kingston and his female accomplice were tried and convicted by local authorities on the charge of first-degree murder. Kingston's death reminds us that there are men in this land who say they are Americans, who perhaps think that they are Americans and yet speak openly and loudly against the principles of freedom and equality, the principles of democracy. There's little difference between such men and the enemies across the seas whom we have conquered. There's little difference between such men and the criminals they so often employ. For they are criminals themselves. In the end, they will be caught. Because their crimes are crimes against the people. 
against the government, against the FBI. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. Tonight, will you join the Equitable Society in a salute to an industry which shares the responsibility of passing on the wisdom of the world from one generation to another? An industry which makes possible the great system of free education for everyone, which is one of the foundations of our American democracy. Yes, a salute of gratitude to the book publishing industry of the United States. During the war... The publishers rose to the emergency and supplied over 90 million specially manufactured paper-bound books to the armed forces, almost 800 titles, about eight books for every serviceman or woman. Now that peace is here, we will look to the book publishers for more than 10,000 new titles each year. These will range from the scientific works, which carry forward the torch of progress, to the fiction, which relaxes you in your hours of leisure. For many years, funds of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States have been invested in the book publishing industry. In fact, Equitable Society funds have been a consistent factor in the growth and development of most of the great industries on which America depends for full employment and continued prosperity. Just as Equitable Society dollars were fighting dollars in wartime, so at all times they are security dollars for you your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The file on The Desert Dictator. Incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Leith Stevens. The author was Arthur Lawrence. Your narrator was Reed Hadley, who appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. This is your FBI. is a Jerry Devine production. This is Dick Joy speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. The Equitable Society reminds you that tomorrow is Navy Day. We'd like to take this moment to say thanks, Navy, for a job well done. The U.S. Navy played a tremendous part in beating the Japanese. It was the tiny Pacific fleet that stopped the enemy offensive at Midway. Navy ships turned the tide of the war in the furious night battles off the Solomons. Halsey's powerful third fleet crushed the Jap Navy in the battles of the Philippine Sea, making it possible for American warships and planes to blast enemy cities at will. Throughout the war, the Navy has spearheaded victory. Men of the Navy deserve the gratitude of their countrymen. One of the best ways Americans can show their appreciation is by guarding the goals for which these men fought, by maintaining a strong, peacetime Navy. This is the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>